And so I just want to start out, you know, the title of this was, you know, leading with respect for better performance and learning. And just, just want to start off with like, why does that matter? Why do we care about respect? Um, and the one thing with lean, we often hear, you know, we want to create organizations where we can contribute to society. At the same time, we want to have um, development and growth opportunities for our partners, and employees, and we want to get better performance and better um, business results, which we can get if we lead in a way that shows respect. And so some of this is you, oftentimes when people start applying lean tools, they'll get some benefits from the technical tools, but then those um, gains start to fall off. So if you look at this graphic from the Toyota way to continuous improvement, you'll see early on people get gains with the philosophy and without the philosophy. But then when you get to a certain point, you start to see those um, lose the benefits um, if you're not leading away with the philosophy. And that's because the technical tools do provide some gains, but as you start to expand and get further and deeper, you get better results when you tie it to the underlying thinking or philosophy of lean and are showing respect for people, enabling them to bring their best selves to work. And so in that regard, it's just better to start off if we're always leading with respect. And if you do start to see um, that you're not getting the results you expect with lean, think about what is, how are you using lean? Are you doing it in ways that align with that underlying thinking philosophy? And so how do we go about showing that respect as we um, view lean and develop lean as a system that's enabling? Um, Paul Adler's work talks about coercive or enabling bureaucracies and what that work came up on studying Toyota and seeing that like they really had all the structure of a bureaucracy, but it was enabling people to be um, more successful and to solve problems versus traditionally when we hear bureaucracy, we think of it as a coercive bureaucracy where it's used to control people. So how do we do that as an enabling um, system? And because bureaucracy has just such negative baggage, just thinking about it as a system takes away even some of that negative thought process. And so um, one of my mentors, Jim Morgan, always says like you get the culture that you create or that you tolerate. And so how do we create that culture that we want? And we can do that through developing an, um, a lean enabling system. And so this framework here is um, socio-technical systems, which theory, which is pretty common theory in the organizational design um, department. It basically says is that people and um, technical systems interact with each other. And so it isn't that lean is all about people or lean is all about process. It really is about both and how do they fit together? How do you design that system that enables people to be satisfied and have better performance? How do you design that that it just lets people be successful? And we can do that and achieve that by thinking about what are our behaviors that align with that underlying thinking or philosophy of lean? And so it's our behaviors that we can change. And so what are our behaviors and how we lean use lean tools and techniques to enable people to be successful. And so then, you know, that is, you know, we've got the why does respect matter? How do we show respect by how do we use tools and techniques? But what is respect? And so wanted to um, use the framework from Toyota Way 2001. And Toyota 2001 was Toyota's attempt when they realized that as they got larger and spread um, throughout the world, deeper and got had more people that they weren't staying true to their core beliefs. And so they things that they'd always transferred implicitly for years, they needed to make um, more explicit, more codified so that as they coach and develop people. So they um, created the Toyota Way 2001 to share their guiding principles. And that has two pillars, um, respect for people and continuous improvement. And today I really want to focus on that respect for people piece. And when I think about um, even continuous improvement is, yes, that's what we need to get better business results, but a lot of the continuous improvement are the opportunities where we can show respect for people. And that really is in service to respecting people, enabling them to bring them best selves to work. And so with that respect for people, there are two portions of that. There's respect, which is that we respect others, make every effort to understand each other, take responsibility, and do our best to build mutual trust and teamwork, which is we stimulate personal and professional growth, share the opportunities development and maximize individual and team performance. So things that you know I'm hearing a lot in that is that we're understanding each other and that we're creating conditions for growth. And so then um, the next um, rest of the presentation is I'm gonna share a lot of frameworks that can help tie into that understanding of 
understanding people or what are their opportunities for growth, the things to think about so that it's to be a, to reflect on as you're using lean tools. And so I want to start with um, understanding needs and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And a lot of the stuff with lean were really focused on that growth. I mean, it was in that teamwork aspect and we want to stimulate personal and professional growth. And that growth need is at the top of the hierarchy of needs, but you can't be in a position to grow unless your lower level needs are met. So just starting with the basics with um, the people need to have their physiological needs met and then they can focus on their safety needs. So, you know, do we have a place to sleep at night that's warm? Do we have access to food? Once we have those basic need, you know, physiological needs of food and warmth and rest met, then we focus on our safety needs. Do we have security and safety? And once those are met, those are our basic needs, we can focus on our psychological needs. Um, do we have belongingness and love needs, we, which we get from our relationships and our friends? Do we have our esteem needs, our prestige and feeling of accomplishment? And only when those needs are met, and those are all um, deficit needs. So you're just, you're motivated to be able to get your needs met. And then you move on to self-fulfillment needs, which um, your motivation within that self-fulfillment grows as you achieve more. And so that really is about achieving your full potential and really focusing on the, in creative activities. And so in terms of lean and that growth and the creativeness of continuous improvement, we want to put people in a position to have their self-fulfillment needs met. And a lot of times when we approach lean, we approach it in the standpoint that everyone is in that spot. And a lot of people aren't there. They're maybe working on their basic needs or maybe working on their psychological needs. And I think, you know, in the last few months with COVID-19, um, a lot of us have been pushed, um, probably everyone to some degree or other, back away from self-fulfillment needs. And a lot of people probably weren't there to begin with into psychological needs or basic needs. Um, I know personally that I had that big push of, I was not previously focused on my safety needs. My safety needs were met pre-COVID-19. And then the last few months, that's been a much bigger um, focus on how do I make sure that I am safe and secure. And in terms of the workplace, that's not just our workplace needs met, um, but what's going on in people's personal lives that's impacting their safety, their family's situation, their community situation, and really focus not just on the physical safety, but their psychological safety as well. And so how do we, you know, in this time, and always make sure that people's basic needs and psychological needs are met before we're in that position to help them grow and develop to meet their self-actualization needs. And so these are questions that um, certainly don't expect anyone to have a quick answer to these. These are really are for reflection and things to think about as you're in your organizations and thinking about how you're using lean on are you doing it in ways that enable this? So are you creating a culture that enables people to discuss their needs? You know, how can you support people to have their needs met and enable them to grow? How do your behaviors support or not support people? And how do the behaviors of your colleagues support or not support people? And so, and if the behaviors aren't supporting people, have you set expectations for behaviors? If you don't set expectations, you can't be surprised if um, people aren't behaving how you would want them to. And so that first step is that, you know, what are the behaviors that align with the culture that you want to create? How, set the expectations for those. And then if you, those expectations aren't met, how do you respond when behaviors don't meet expectations? Are you coaching people? Are you creating the conditions to have conversations about it? Are you going to be creating that culture that you want? Or are you going to tolerate what just happens? Um, and then if, you know, you're fortunate to be in that self-fulfillment area, one of the next frameworks I um, want to share is from Dan Daniel Pink's work um, that he captured in Drive, which is really about intrinsic motivation. And so it's really interesting, at least from my perspective, that for creative work, um, people need three things for better performance and personal satisfaction, and that's purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Um, you actually get worse results in creative work if people, um, if you try to extrinsically motivate them. So it's one of those things that like, which aligns with, you know, Maslow's hierarchy and me, like if you're in that top self-fulfillment, you're going to be able to be focused on growth. And that is where you need intrinsic motivation. And so from those three things as purpose that people need to know 
why they're doing their work. There needs to be some purpose, value in the work that they're doing and have see some connection to that. Having autonomy, which doesn't mean do whatever you want, but it has, it's having some control over what your work is and the, what you're doing. And so it's not just being told every you know, detail of what to do, but you get some control over some piece of your work. It doesn't mean total freedom, but some sense of control and then mastery, which is really focused on skill development. And so that isn't that you've mastered a skill as much as it is that you're getting that opportunities for skill development and growth. So if you've mastered a skill to continue meeting that need for mastery, you might need to be to switch and focus on another skill. And so it really is that development piece that ties in with the respect for people and that teamwork that you're creating those growth opportunities. And so I'd say like in um, Continuous improvement requires creative work. So how do we're not going to be successful with continuous improvement if we're not creating these conditions that enable people to do work creatively um, at their optimal scale. And so does product process and service development, which is where I do most of my work. And so then here's how those things can play out in practice. And these are examples from product and process development, but they apply to a lot of other um, lean scenarios as well. And so one of the things is that you want to enable individuals and teams to manage the flow of activity within their teams. And that gives them autonomy, is that they've got some control over what is that activity that they're doing. Creating and maintaining their own checklists and standards, that provides autonomy. In some ways, you know, that's kind of, some people think, how does a standard create an autonomy? Well, it's that they've got the ownership to improve the work. So it's, and then you get all the benefits of standards across the organization, but it's giving that you have that ability to improve the work. Um, developing your skills through on the job training with mentoring uh, meets the mastery need and then continuously improve processes and products provides mastery. And then understanding and connecting to each other's work and the overall program or project plans can provide purpose. So how does you create the conditions for someone to understand how their work fits into the organization? And that can really um, help people see what's the purpose of the work. We need to know why we're doing something to be satisfied. And so in that um, context, I have reflect on a lot of lean tools on how do they fit into the autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And there's some tools that I can see, okay, I can see how it fits into autonomy and mastery, but not necessarily purpose. And so as if you're using this to reflect on, don't necessarily think, something needs to fit all three of those, but collectively people need all three of those. So how do you as an organization, as a system, make sure that people have autonomy, mastery and purpose collectively in their work so that they are both satisfied and perform better. So it's a win-win for the individual and the organization, which is a lot of what we're trying to achieve with lean. Um, so some just reflection questions on these topics are how are you supporting people to have autonomy, mastery, and purpose? And so this is, you know, one that I really like to think about in terms of any lean method or tool being used. How does it provide one or all three of those? And collectively, are you providing all three of those? And then you'll see some repetition with this. Um, these questions were on the previous reflection question slide as well on how do your behavior support or not support people? How do the behaviors of your colleagues support or not support people? Do you set expectations for behaviors? And how do you respond when behaviors don't meet expectations? And it can be helpful to also think about each of these frameworks, not just in terms of your organization, but in terms of your individual um, perspective as well. How does this relate for you, for your home life, even or within at work life? Like, how do these things fit for you? How do they fit for your organization? And then um, the next framework I'm going to support here are things that focus on how do you support learning and growth. And so if we're in that top piece of the pyramid for learning and growth, we want to support people to learn and grow as best as possible. Um, you know, everyone's always learning and growing a little, but how do we create the conditions that enable them to have their optimal learning and growth? Because that's how we can show the most respect for them is in enabling them to learn and grow. Um, that being said, that's if we're in that upper pyramid, if someone's in there just getting their basic needs met, they're not ready for learning and growth. So it's disrespectful to try to push them to learn and grow. And so we need to understand where they are and what are they ready for. Um, the model here on the left um, is the Yerkes-Dotson law. And so it 
which is, I think, I think it's really interesting, but I can be pretty nerdy, um, is that for a simple task, you can get better performance, but just continual um, stimulation. Like if it's the more reward you're getting, you're gonna get better performance. But for things that are more difficult or, you know, the more stress you create, you'll get better performance for a simple task. But if it's a difficult task, there's an optimal point of stress or uncomfortableness that it leads to the best performance. So if something is really easy, um, really comfortable to do, you're not going to get very good performance if you're not at all stressed. But if you get overstressed with a difficult task, people are going to shut down. They're going to enter fight or flight and you're not going to get results. Um, so this research was translated into the graphic on the right, which is probably a little bit easier to connect to um, by Carl Ronke in the um, 70s in the um, outdoor adventure research um, field and you know, termed it the psychological performance zones. And so that middle zone is the comfort zone. And that's, you know, you're really comfortable with what you're doing. There's no, um, you're not being challenged, you're very comfortable. That's you know similar to that low arousal and these the weak performance that you get from the York Stiles and low. That optimal performance zone is that medium level of um, stimulus, and it's where you're gonna get your optimal performance. You're challenged enough, you're gonna stretch, you're gonna grow, you're gonna develop. And then there's the danger zone where you shut down. You're not gonna be learning and developing if you get pushed into that danger zone. And so when you're in um, thinking about how do you best support people's learning and growth, you wanna put them in conditions where they're in their optimal performance zone. Um, you know, we don't wanna create that sink or swim in the danger zone. We don't want you know, people to be too comfortable in their comfort zone because it is that um, they're not being challenged and not being developed. So it's actually disrespectful in that lens that someone's in their comfort zone because they're not being given the opportunities to learn and grow if they're ready for growth. That being said, someone focused on their basic needs, the respectful way to um, treat them is to put them in positions where they're in their comfort zone because they can't focus on learning and growth right now. If they're focused on how to be safe, you don't wanna be putting them in that stressful situation of trying to grow and develop because it's not respecting where they are currently. And so this, how this, um, I like to connect with this one with those performance zones. So this is um, thinking about so my experience is, and it's, maybe these are outdoor adventure related because that's where the research came from. And so that's how I tied to. So I wanna challenge you to think about how does this connect for you? This, this is the um, Bright Angel Trail in the Grand Canyon South Rim. And the first time I um, went there, I've, actually the only time I went there, I sat on top of that trail for an hour looking at the foot of snow that came down the night before and know, thinking about all the ice there. And I was supposed to be on a three day adventure trip going into the canyon. And I was just, I was uncomfortable. I was stressed um, about the idea of hiking on ice and falling to my death. And, um, but I was thankfully not there by myself. I was there with, um, there were four of us and one person has probably hiked in the Grand Canyon well over a hundred times. The other two people was also their first time um, but they certainly had more hiking experience than I did. And so it was with this team that helped me move from my danger zone into my optimal performance zone. And so that really did, that was creating those conditions. So it isn't, some of that is like thinking about the individual, what's the support you provide them to help move them, either push them from a comfort zone into an optimal performance zone in the right ways and how you're coaching and creating opportunities. Or if someone, the condition is something that would be in someone's danger zone, what's the support you create to pull them down to in their optimal performance zone so that they can move forward and learn. Um, and that what someone's zones look like also change over time. So this was seven years ago that the thought of hiking on ice terrified me. And then three months ago, um, I hiked on ice in Zion National Park, and I didn't think anything about it. It is now in my comfort zone. So over time, you know, you can move from your danger zone to maybe your to your optimal performance zone to where you're then in your um, comfort zone. And that every individual's comfort zone and optimal performance zone and danger zone are going to be very different. I've also had lots of people suggest I do this particular hike. Um, which is Angel's Landing in Zion National Park. And it's um, 
well over a thousand feet drop offs on both sides and with a very narrow path that terrifies me. And I can't tell you how many people have told me, I'll be fine, I should do it. And um, the one time I attempted to do it, I didn't go very far before I turned around and you know, had that self-reflection on what was I thinking, having other people try to influence what my optimal performance zone without them respecting where I was. And I know that in some way translates differently than before, but this was a time when it was outside of the particular situation um, in the moment. Those people weren't with me holding my hand as I tried to go. Um, they were people who had told me the week before or months prior that this is something I could do. And so just recognize that don't, you've got to really be there to read the situation with someone on when you're helping, if they're in their danger zone, pulling them to their optimal performance zone, respect that this is something that someone can't do or isn't willing to do. I don't think this will ever be in my optimal performance zone. Um, it terrifies me and I'm okay with that. And I think that's a big thing is that recognizing that everyone's zones are different. Other people think that this is very easy. Um, but so instead of that, one time I did attempt that, it then made me um, lose time in relaxing before I then, and had to de-stress before I went in and finished the West Rim hike I was planning on doing. And I didn't get to the end because I had to recover from my attempt to do that. And so then this was six months after that, I redid that hike, which is where I hiked through the ice. And this was my challenge. I did 17 miles that day and over 4,000 elevation. And that was the challenge that I needed and wanted. And that was very different. I know a lot of people that do Angel's Landing would never do this long of a hike. And so it is very much that everyone's zones are different and what are their goals and how do you use those zones in a way that support people where they are. Um, so then, you know, the reflection questions tied to this one are, how do you understand and um, help people understand where they are in the performance zones? How can you res show respect for where they are? And so think about this, not, you know, my zone is the same as your zone, but everyone's zones are different. And how do you show respect for people on where they are? And then also, how do you create opportunities to support people to learn and grow? Are you creating those situations where people are in their comfort zone? Um, a lot of times, you know, with respect, people think it's nice, and it's nice to be comfortable, um, but you aren't being stretched and given those opportunities to develop if you aren't being put in your optimal performance zones. And you know, how do your behaviors support or not support people? How do the behaviors of your colleagues support or not support people? And what are those expectations that you're setting? And then um, this is uh, another framework which I think ties very well with um, this thinking is the the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And so if we're in that learning and growth space from the, our hierarchy of needs and the, you know, the respect for people aspect, we need to have a mindset for learning and growth. Um, so this is Carol Dweck's work from, um, who's out of Stanford in her book, Mindset. And with a growth mindset, um, you really think you can develop your abilities, challenges help me grow, feedback is constructive, effort is necessary to meet my goals. And then with a fixed mindset, it is the either I can do it or I can't. I stick to what I know. I don't like receiving feedback. If I'm frustrated, I give up. And it's one of those that this is introduced here as kind of a discrete, I either have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And I think everyone probably has certain situations where they have a growth mindset and certain situations where they have a fixed mindset, depending on the situation, the task. Certainly there are things you're gonna be more, um, you might, you know, more free, more often have a growth mindset or more often have a fixed mindset. And what we wanted with the lean, it really ties in well with that growth mindset. And, um, but it ties in with those performance zones as well, is that if someone has a um, fixed mindset, they're kind of behaving like they're always in that danger zone or in the comfort zone. So either you give them work in their comfort zone or you, and they can do it or they're in their danger zone and they can't do it and they don't really have that optimal performance zone. Um, but also if you push someone who traditionally has a growth mindset into their danger zone, they're going to shut down and develop more of a fixed mindset. So it's just something to be careful like as you're coaching and providing those learning opportunities, how can you look for 
what someone's mindset is and how do they respond to the issue and have you pushed them into their danger zone and now they're starting to behave with a fixed mindset. Um, but with, I mean, you know, we want to have that growth mindset. And so I think um, the good news is everyone can develop a growth mindset and that ties in really well with um, John Shook's quote about it's easier to act your way to a new way of thinking than to think your way to a new way of acting. And so that really is um, same and all of this is around those behaviors we're using. What are our behaviors in using lean that are going to that culture that we want? We develop a growth mindset by behaving with a growth mindset, coaching with a growth mindset, and you know, teaching with a growth mindset. So how do you ask questions to enable people to get a growth mindset? How do you behave and model that growth mindset ability? Um, I certainly you know, reflect back on situations where I had a fixed mindset. And I would encourage you to, to do that as well. Think about experiences you've had on, were you exhibiting a growth mindset? What caused you have a fixed mindset? And did you um, translate things over time? And so I certainly, um, trying to give you know certain personal examples of all these and with the fixed mindset, I look at writing as someplace I always had a fixed mindset. I always got B's in English growing up. Went to college and I got a C um, in RUT 105 and thought, of course I got a C in RUT 105. It's writing. I'm terrible at writing. Um, never wrote more than a couple pages and that was stressful enough for me and I had no intention to ever get better than that. And then I found myself um, having to write a dissertation which was over 100 pages. And that very much was in my danger zone and probably why I was a little slow um, on writing that initially. And when I finally through once again had um, my research group helped pull me into the optimal performance zone. You know, feedback and support from mentors all helped me make it so that was something I could take on. And when I did start getting that core writing down, you know, it took me six months to write the first main chapter. It took me two months to write the next main chapter. It took me two weeks to write the next main chapter. And then I was able to rewrite that in two days when I needed to and really saw where that went from danger zone to stretch with an optimal performance zone to where it was then in my comfort zone. Um, and so, and I've taken on other writing projects where I can certainly see my behavior of the it's a big task and danger zone and how do you create those conditions to um, be pulled into your optimal performance zone through support from colleagues, from mentors, et cetera. And so that's, um, as you're designing your organizations, as you're coaching people, how do you create the conditions for people to develop a growth mindset? How can you model a growth mindset when leading coaching? And how do your behaviors support or not support people? How do the behaviors your colleagues support or not support people? Do you set expectations for behaviors? And how do you respond when behaviors don't meet the expectations? And so all of these frameworks really are focused on that as you were using lean tools can any of these be helpful in thinking about how you're supporting people and showing respect for people or not? And if you're not, how can you adjust what you're doing and adjust your, change your behavior to lead in a way that's showing respect? Um, and so this was um, just an intro on these topics. It's stuff I have been thinking about for a while, but I've got a couple ongoing projects to try to make it more accessible. I know this was very heavy on the theory and it is right now. And so I'm working on a book on uh, lean product and process development, to try to make this more accessible and how do these ideas and theories play out in product development and how you develop people while developing products. And then also doing some work with, um, and I'm doing that work on the, with um, John Dragos. And then also doing work with Tony Benner and Margie Hagany on in lean coaching, teaching and leadership. Um, how do we make this more um, easier to do, accessible? How do we make it more accessible, more pragmatic, less theory based um, focused on, you know, it's all about respect and just giving you theory isn't respectful to you. How do we make this more accessible so it's easier to use on a regular and daily basis? And so just in general, I want to leave with the, how do you show respect? Just something to reflect on in general. It's more than just being nice to people because being nice can actually be disrespectful if you're not giving people that opportunity to learn and grow. I'm not saying don't be nice. I like it when people are nice. Um, and then, you know, just how are your behaviors supporting or not supporting people? 
how do behaviors your colleagues support or not support people? And you know, are you setting expectations for behaviors? Are you coaching when behaviors deviate from expectations? Are there any questions? I went through that fairly fast. Thank you, Katrina. It looks like Lynn had a question and you may have answered it. What are some signs you've pushed someone into their danger zone and how can you recognize it? Um, so thank you, Lynn, for that question. It is a great question. I, so I think with so much of this, it is the, um, it's listening on and observing their behavior. So if someone starts behaving with a fixed mindset, that is certainly a good sign that you've pushed them into their danger zone. And so if someone, if there's something, you know, someone that traditionally is willing to do stuff and they're not doing it or they're finding excuses, one of those signs of that resistance might be because they've been pushed into their danger zone. There's always something behind the resistance. And so the danger zone might be one of those reasons. Thank you. She also asked, conversely, signs that people are stuck in their comfort zone and how to identify if it's okay to move people out of their comfort zone. So I think with that, how to identify coming out, um, go back to the Maslow's hierarchy of need and really understand, are they in a position? Um, and this, you likely want to do this through a conversation, not just observing and then making your own assumptions based on their behaviors. But is it obvious that they're in positions where they're working on their basic needs or their um, psychological needs? And then um, if it isn't, certainly have those conversations on that what we're, trying to do with lean is help you grow and develop. And you, you can use that Maslow's hierarchy of needs as that framework and see, you know, from their perspective, give them that, that opportunity to say where they are on it. And they might, they might not be willing to share that, but at least, at least you can try to create that, use that to create the conditions to have the conversation to understand why they're resisting being pushed out of the comfort zone. Some people also, you know, are in any interest to develop and grow. Um, and they're and they just are in a position in their life where they don't want to they're comfortable not developing and growing and that's okay too just is that a good fit for what you need as an organization as well and so that can create the conditions where to have those conversations respectfully thank you well katrina thank you and it doesn't look like there's any more questions oh wait maybe we got one more here it just came in it says, how does lean thinking develop autonomy? So if, and how lean thinking develops autonomy, it's more of the, there are certain aspects of lean that align with autonomy. So in continuous improvement, a big part of that is that you're improving your processes. And so you're giving everyone that opportunity to understand like how can their work being improved and so that ability to improve your work provides people autonomy and so a lot of times we think about standards as not giving the opposite of autonomy but if you use standards as the foundation for improvement and you're creating those conditions to enable the work to be improved you're giving everyone autonomy through giving them that ability to improve their work Sure, that was the last question. Yep, that was it. So thank you everybody for attending today. Katrina, thank you so much for doing this for us today. We really appreciate it and hope everybody has a great day. Thank you.